Hi, I'm Michelle Koch, the Director of the Muslim Church Solidarity Committee. Welcome to the second episode of the Global Cafe. Today we will be hearing from two people who are very special to us. Taufik Zakaria is an artist, a calligrapher, and historian from India. And Ruben Shimanov is the Muslim Jewish Solidarity Committee's Director of Educational Experiences and Programming, as well as an artist and calligrapher, and he's located in the United States. Um, Taufik is Muslim and Ruben is Jewish, but they both actually specialize in calligraphy, both in Hebrew and in Arabic. And it's just so special and remarkable how their separate individual learning journeys, their curiosity and, and their arts, um, it led them to exemplify what real genuine solidarity and, and getting to know the other means. And fortunately, it led them to each other and to develop this really special friendship, although they never got to meet each other in person. The Muslim Jewish Solidarity Committee's connection to Tofik is very special as well. In 2015, we held an event for Hanukkah, and it took place in a mosque in New York City and appropriately titled Hanukkah in a Mosque. Somehow, all the way in India, Tofik heard about it and created a very special calligraphy piece for us that said Hanukkah both in Arabic and in Hebrew. And of course that just touched us on so many levels and was so, so deeply meaningful to us. Um, so fast forward to now, December 2020, we just launched a publishing platform for arts and written works. And of course we had to reach back to Taufik and see if he would like to participate in the program. And he was kind enough to create uh, a special piece for the launch and it was actually a recreation of the Hanukkah piece that we got from him five years ago. All are welcome to publish with us your art or written works so if you're interested please fill in the application you can find the link on our website at muslimjurisolidarity.org and on our social media and please stay tuned for the next uh, monthly global cafe session but for now enjoy Tofik and Ruben's fascinating conversation hi Tofik. Uh, my name is uh, Ruben Shimanov I am the director of educational experiences and programming uh, for the Muslim Jewish Solidarity Committee and I'm so excited to be speaking with you today as part of a new initiative that we're doing with MJSC, which is called Global Cafe. It's a time for us to highlight the stories of different Muslim and Jewish uh, faith-based community leaders um, around the world. And uh, it's an opportunity for us to hear more about their stories, uh, the work that they've been doing, and how it's connected to interfaith Muslim-Jewish community building. And so we're really, really excited to have you um, as, uh, as we launch this new initiative. I was actually, before we uh, dive in, I was actually looking at um, our correspondences through the years. And the reason <laughs> why really I'm, <laughs> yeah, the reason I'm, I'm really excited about this for, for multiple reasons. Number one, because you have a really special story to tell and one that um, uh, that folks need to know and it's something that's really touching and is a is a really special example of the kind of bridges we can build um, as Muslims and Jews um, but aside from that on a deeper level I'm also so excited to speak to you because of your artistry and the fact that I'm also far less of an accomplished calligraphy artist, but someone who also really gets excited by uh, Arabic and Hebrew calligraphy. Mm -hmm. And even on a deeper level, it's because you and I have uh, established a virtual relationship, friendship that has that is 10 years old. And the way I know this is I actually went to Facebook Messenger to see what is the first, when was the first time we communicated on yes. Messenger? Maybe it was even a little bit 
earlier in just, uh, you know, posting on walls. But on December 2nd, 2010, <laughs> almost exactly 10 years ago, uh, we started talking. And at that time, 10 years ago is when I was first introduced to your incredible work as an artist, as a, uh, a community a community leader in many ways, because what you are doing, and we'll talk about it, and uh, the, the, the way that you created awareness about the um, history and the culture of Jews from South India, um, from Cochin, is uh, it's something really, really incredible. And so from that moment, 10 years ago, until today, I've been really uh, touched and impressed by um, by all this work that you've been doing, all, by the way, on the side. You have a whole career and profession that is also something different and incredible. And this is just stuff that was coming as a labor of love. And so I want to welcome you again and thank you for all that you uh, have been doing. And, and hopefully today we'll have an opportunity to just hear a little bit more about your journey in terms of Muslim Jewish community building, interfaith work, and how it connects uh, to your own story. So welcome again. Thank you so much for joining us. So thank you. This is the Indian way <laughs> of doing it. And uh, I'm just actually overwhelmed with joy. And uh, I don't know what to say because I didn't know that time have uh, passed so far, like 10 years that we have been in touch. And uh, maybe it seems like it happened yesterday that I messaged you yesterday. That's what I feel like. But when you told it's exactly almost 10 years, I cannot even believe it. But it's wonderful. And thank you for uh, choosing me to be part of your new initiative. Uh, so you can uh, shoot in questions. I'm also <laughs> ready to <laughs> share Amazing. all the details what I can share about myself. Oh, wonderful, wonderful. And, and, uh, and the reason why I, we, we was in touch because of the commonality between us, the Hebrew the, and the Arabic calligraphy, the art. It's exactly. actually bridge, with the bridge between us. <laughs> that's a really, that's such a beautiful thing that you just said. Yeah, art uh, was, the, was the kind of the basis of our um, correspondence and, 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 and friendship. And, and what it shows is it, it shows the power of art to build bridges, to um, strengthen communities, and to strengthen and enhance understanding between, between people. So I agree with you 100%. And, uh, and that's why, again, I'm so excited that we're talking halfway across the world. I'm right now in Seattle. You are in the Emirates in Dubai. And so, um, again, this just shows the power of how art and how a commitment to learning about one another can forge these uh, connections across, that span the globe. Um, so very, very excited. So Tofik, I was wondering if you could actually begin with um, your a little bit about your, your, your own biography. So you're originally from South India, from, uh, from Kochi, correct? Yeah, and um, and so I was wondering if you can uh, tell us a little bit about growing up in Kochi in the state of Kerala, and and also your interaction with the Jewish communities there. Yes, uh, so Kochi is a very small island. It has very uh, long colonial history. So uh, and the, it's a small island. I told you. So there are more almost. Uh, more than 18 communities, the people speak different language, even though they speak a common language, they have a, a different language in their house. So there will be a different uh, types of Muslims, there are different types of Jews, there are different types of Christians, there are different types of uh, hin Hindus. So types means they have a different story and history to tell to us. They came from, migrated from one part and came to Cochin because it was a very cosmopolitan city like uh, like the way the Dubai is right now, like hosting lots of people, 
and it's it's a miniature world i would rather say so it was the then coaching 500 years back or 400 years back so that's how so you go to coaching you will find a jew street you will find a, a street which is meant for muslim so there is a street for the gujarati it's uh, there is gujarati is a, a state in india again like kerala so and they speak different language they have different food culture they have different uh, belief system and everything but at the end of the day all of these people get gel well and that's all about my city so a city a small a small island uh, having more than 18 communities speaking more than 18 languages getting along well and it's just a very small island so uh, me being from a very uh, a normal i don't say a very orthodox family or a very strict religious family but we uh, are very uh, a family which will be, uh, believe in humanity helping each other that's what i learned from my mother my grandmother my parents my relatives so when i was young my grandmother used to give me a bag of food or something i'll take this and give to that lady please she's she might be uh, starving for the day so that's how we grow up so helping each other was part of our daily life and understanding each other. That is, again, when you go to school, in my school, there will be like 50 students, but everybody are from different, different, different uh, religion, caste, whatever it is. So we all get well along and get to know each other and try to learn, try to understand about their uh, uh, I mean, festivals and wish them on the same day and taking part in their festivals. So that's how. So that is all about uh, my place where I was born and brought up. So going further, uh, when I was in the madrasa where I was learning my Arabic and basic Quran lessons, the, uh, the priest, I won't say a priest, but the teacher used to talk, talk about this uh, on every Sundays during once the class is finished, he will ask us to join, sit together in a place and we used to, he used to narrate the stories from Quran which is almost similar to the biblical stories. So the patriarchs like Abraham, Moses, David, all, all of these characters also join us. <laughs> so we, we was like, maybe his, the way he narrated the stories affected uh, or like just give a tip off to learn much more about them, to understand about their religion, what was their idea. So, uh, who was Abraham? Who was this? Who was David? So, the same Ibrahim, same Moshe, same uh, uh, David, Dawood. So, these characters actually made me get into the Jewish culture. And there is a small story one of my colleagues told that he went to the synagogue and the pass near to it. So, I insisted my father to take me to the synagogue and the palace but unfortunately the palace was closed even the synagogue was but me being a small like 10 year old guy or lesser than that i do think so lesser than 10 maybe 8 or 10 years old my father took me and i still remember all the shots frame by frame while i was walking how the 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 street was the it was yellow lighted street with a long very um, uh, narrow view street. I was walking with my father. Literally, I was running ahead from my father because I want to see the place first. But it was like a time traveling for me. And for a 10 year old guy, it was so amusing to walk through that place of history and go to the, uh, the synagogue. And I didn't know much about the Judaism or synagogue or something like that, but some curiosity took me there. And uh, there was the gatekeeper he told, oh no, it's closed, it's only open for the prayer and you are not um, a Jew, so you cannot go inside. So I, I was insisting, no, I want to just go and see. I want, and I was making all the mess around. <laughs> you can imagine how a 10 year old guy can mess around the scene. So <laughs> nothing uh, lesser than that, I was. So somebody, a, a person, a, uh, a Jewish person came out of the synagogue and he told, look at me and uh, he asked to the gatekeeper, what happened? So he told like, this guy want to go inside and see. Okay, this is a small chap. Okay, come in, I'll take you. I don't know who it, uh, it was. I, could, I couldn't uh, 
spot him later on. But this guy took me inside and showed me the synagogue. And it was fully littered. I think it was a uh, Sabbath or some function festival was happening because the synagogue was fully littered with the candles and it was so wonderful. So that picture was always inside my mind as a seed, which actually grew up as a tree while I was also growing up. Wow. So and that was the first time I encountered mm. with the, the Jew Jewish uh, culture. So later on, when I finished my 10th standard, that means I was around 15 or 16, 14, yeah, around that time, we used to go as a regular visitor to the synagogue, just like a tourist. So every day our friends will be going to the palace, to the synagogue and the beach. That was our daily routine. So we go there, sit near the uh, window and just get the bre cool breeze. Maybe uh, it was a very uh, positive place. It's very cool. Place. So we'll go back to the mm -hmm. house. So that was uh, how I started. Then I met with some Jewish people and interested. I started learning Hebrew, so and so things <laughs> that I can explain you maybe in your next questions. Yeah. So, wow. So it sounds like, um, uh, Cochin, I, I know it's both called Kochi and Cochin, right? There are two ways to to call the... Yes. Um, well, how do you... So you say Cochin. Jewish people... Yeah, it is Kochi in our land. Like in Malayalam, we say Kochi. In English, uh -huh. they write Cochin. Gotcha. In Hebrew, the old Hebrew scriptures, we, it is written Kogin. And in modern, it's written Kotsin. Yeah, because yeah. The, the, the chair sound isn't in Hebrew, so they have to find other letters yeah. to kind of... They have to that. email or with... <laughs> Understood. Thank you. So it sounds like from what you uh, explain, Cochin was was historically this multicultural, multi-ethnic, multi-faith uh, place, This uh, mm -hmm. uh, a, a, a city where a lot of different... Uh, communities were living side by side. And part of that story, part of that multi-cultural uh, story was uh, the Jewish presence. And um, and as you so beautifully described uh, already, you were, as a child, already having this interest in, in wanting to learn more about, in many ways, your neighbors, right? Because this is your city, and these are all neighbors of yours and so it's it's this uh, curiosity um that that led you to to um to explore more and that that curiosity only blossomed i was wondering before we go on and hear a little bit more about how that curiosity blossomed and and how the um, uh the kinds of relationships you started building with uh, jews of the of the city um before that i was wondering if you can just tell us a little bit about um, the, um, the, the, the history of, of Jewish communities in, you know, the, the history of Jews in South Asia is a, is a big history and there's a lot to be said. We can zoom in on the, the, uh, the history, just a couple of things about um, uh, Jews in Kerala, in, um, in uh, Cochin. Sometimes I know it's also sp spoken more broadly, like the Jews of the Malabar coast, right? Yes. And so if you could just say a little bit, for those who don't know, there might be people listening to this who, who actually don't, didn't even know that there were Jewish, that there was a Jewish presence in uh, South India. So if you could tell us a little bit about that. Yeah. So when you speak about Kerala, there is a first place where a Christian church was established in India. It was the first place where a synagogue was established in India. It was the first place where a mosque was established in India. So that is the specialty of Kerala or the Malabar coast. So mm. all of these three Semitic religions had established their house of prayer wow. in Kerala. Wow. So it was, it's, it's the legend. It's how we believe and this is what historically everybody accepts. And there will be a different school of thought. We'll keep it aside. For a while uh, okay so you you will get to know like what is all about so religion is for a personal use and humanity is for the 
all the rest of the uh, life purpose. So that's how the people in Kerala <laughs> goes like. Okay. So uh, when you say the juice of Malabar, it's a bigger perspective. Like it is the entire region from the southern tip of India to the Kongan coast. It's so it's like again a region. So entire Kerala was called as Malabar or the all the coastal region was known as Malabar uh, to a particular time. So but and the time went on, the 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 borders have been shrunk, shrunk, and it has gone to like a very small place in Kerala, comprising of two or three districts of the province. So now on a modern perspective, we can say it is juice of Kerala. So I would prefer Malabar, but to understand clearly, we'll say Kerala. So in Kerala, if you look at the history of the Jews, they came, and according to the legend, they came to four different places. So they say it was Madai, Kulut, uh, Parur, and Kudungalu. So all these places, so they have different spots. And again, the inflow of the Jews from different parts of the world in different time happened. And always the Jewish community was nourished or fortified with the addition of new Jews coming in. So, you know, basically there were the oldest Jews known as the Malabari Jews. I would rather call them Malabari Jews and who was the ancient settlers. Then the newcomers were the Pardesi. And there were different, uh, I mean, communities or the congregations in different parts of Kerala. Mm. So, and um, and uh, there were more than 10, more than 10 synagogues uh, mm. and more than 10 uh, congregations, but few were like faded out into the history long back, but few mm. were existing till the, uh, the Aliyah happened. So, and still now there is one synagogue uh, which is which was active and there is a new one, one more synagogue which was uh, I mean re-established and the prayer is still happening there. So technically there is two uh, synagogues in Kerala which is active and there are few which was reconstructed or uh, uh, the government have took initiative to uh, put into the, the tourism map and kept those culture and uh, history alive. Wow. So it seems like the community is both um, has ancient roots that are a couple of thousand of a couple thousand years old, and yes, um, yes. but that throughout history there were it was being as you said kind of nourished by by other migration waves, including um, the Pardesi Jews who are about like 500 years old, right? This was connected to like the Spanish expulsion, I think. Correct? Mm -hmm. Yeah, wow. So, uh, like, I cannot be very specific about that timing and era because there is lots of new studies and researches going on behind this. So few people have different because there are few families who joined 200 years back, 300 years back, 400 years back, and like that. So, and they fall into the category of this Paradesi because I told you the inflow or the influx of the Jews happen almost every time through the year. Which would make sense because again, it's on the coast. This is a trading route. This is a cosmopolitan place, as you said, that, that had been a center for um, different faiths and cultures throughout history. And now it's making, it's making a lot more uh, sense to me. Um, how, how much of a, um, of this of a hub um the malabar coast was and 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 as what we what we know today as as kerala and the community today um how I, I, i'm gonna kind of combine this question with both um what is the um, the the status of the community today is it i hear it's kind of dwindling and um and in connection to that question i would love for you to speak about the work you've been doing in uh, in preserving, in documenting, in, in, in raising awareness about this, uh, the history, the, this lesser known history of Jews from Cochin. And so if you can tell me a little bit about both where the community is at right now and this work that you've been doing. Um, and, um, and yeah, we'll, we'll, then we'll go from there. 
So the I told you the, <clears throat> the Malabari Jewish community and the Pardesi Jewish community. The Malabari Jewish community, there are almost a lesser than 50 number of people still in Cochin. Mm -hmm. They are less than 50, like approximate 40 to 50 number of people. And, and, and the rest the live. The, have, oh, I'm sorry. And the rest live in Israel, right? Large the the, the, the main concentration of yes, Cochin yes. in Israel. Yeah. Yes. This is about Cochin. So in Cochin, in Jew town, uh, which is in the the island which I am talking about, there is only two Jewish uh, people from Pardesi community. Like still, rest everybody have like went back to Israel or they are no more. Some others. So only two. And apart, like from in the mainland, there are about fifty Malabari Jewish uh, people. Mm -hmm. Not 50 exactly. I'm just giving a figure yeah. so that you can clearly uh, think that it is lesser than 50. So uh, that is the situation in, in Kerala. And uh, there are a few other families uh, scattered across and in uh, different parts of Kerala. But not too much. Maybe one or two or three. And there are few converts actually, like approved converts who became a Jew recently, and they are also uh, in Kerala. So that's one thing. And I know a few other people who are not Cochini Jews, but they are Jews married to some other, like American Jews married to a uh, Christian and living in uh, different parts of Kerala. So that is again one thing. Plus, uh, if you look at Israel, there is a good uh, number of Jews living there in Israel who are having the Cochini ancestry. And so, and, so, and so it sounds like, I mean, the community in its uh, ancestral place uh, in, in, in Cochin, in, uh, um, in Kerala, is, is dwindling. And you have been um, playing an important role in making sure that there is an awareness about uh, about this community. Can you tell me a little bit more? And this is maybe going to be connected to, you know, you were saying as a uh, your first experiences as a child, and then you were going to say a little bit more about learning Hebrew. Um, and uh, and I know that um, that was another way that you were connecting to the community. But you also started befriending very closely a few uh, particular people in this dwindling community, a few elderly folks. And so I'd love to hear more about your journey. Uh, and how it connects then to your your exploration your exploration of Hebrew, your connection to the community and some people like Sarah, and the way in which it has allowed for um, greater awareness of this uh, small but uh, important Jewish uh, community. So I'll tell you, like, so I told you about my ten uh, experience when I was ten. So for going forward from there, when I was studying uh, my 11th grade so that's the time when i started my um, contact with the hebrew language before that i knew that there is a language and there is something related but i never came across a scripture in my hand so it was when i was in my 11th grade uh, there was a like very old library my school was around 120 30 years old so the library was so old they was to refurbish so i got a bible from there a gideon's bible which have around 25 different languages uh, i mean a verse from bible is translated to 25 different languages and one among it was hebrew so i knew tamil i know arabic i know uh, english and a uh, little bit of german so i can go through it and understand but the Hebrew was uh, one thing which was very catchy. So I thought I want to find out the word God in it. That was only my intention first. So I went, I tried, I couldn't, I don't know how to, what to do. I don't have uh, access to internet as, as we have uh, because it was a luxury then. Uh, or like, then I was hopeless. I don't know how to do. The next thing what I've done is since I couldn't read or uh, I thought, okay, I'll just copy the lines, like how it is written. I will just copy with a pen. So I tried with an ink pen. I tried with a pencil and it went on. So that's how I started calligraphy. I didn't know I was doing calligraphy <laughs> initially. So I was just copying out that printed Hebrew alphabets into a 
like old notebooks. So around I have uh, 10 or 20 notebooks in my room, in my house. So I used to scribble all the pages. There will be not even a single space for putting a dot. <laughs> so I used to write Hebrew there, there, then. Just copying the letter, didn't know what it was. Handled, so it was going on. So once uh, after class, one day I was, uh, like after my class, I was uh, walking through the beach because my school was a little close to the beach and I had to catch a bus, so I needed to go there. So I was walking by. I saw a second-hand uh, bookshop, like used bookshop. So I saw a Hebrew book. So I went and I opened. So it's not a... Uh, it's a... Tefilot, I think. A prayer book. Yeah, so, uh, Sidur. It's not Sidur. It, it was written as uh, a Okay, just <laughs> prayers. Yeah, interesting. It's a prayer, I think. So th the book is like one, uh, it was printed in 1960 or 1940 or something like that. It's a, a Sephardic uh, prayer book. So I took that book and I asked how much. So he told 250 rupees. For a school going student, 250 rupees is a little bigger. And for the reason I cannot go to my father and ask, I need a 250 rupees to buy a Hebrew book. I was a little scared, but I, my father is uh, like, won't uh, like say anything bad, but still I was a little skeptical about it. So I thought, okay, I'll skip my meals because I used to get 10 rupees every day from my father. Okay, 10, 20, 30 or something like that. Like for the pocket money. So I told, okay, I'll keep all this money. I'll skip my meal. It's fine. I can go back to home and eat. So I kept the money and I had some, like whatever money my mom gives and uh, I go to the shop, I have like money. Uh, so all this money I used to get and kept it around 250 rupees. I, talk, I Every day I go to this guy and tell, don't sell this, don't sell this. This book I want. I want this book you keep. It's safe. Don't let anybody to see it. So every day I go there and I update him. So and finally that the day came and I gave that money to him and I took the book. I was like so excited and sleepless those days. So I went, I saw the book, I opened the book. So one side it was Hebrew, the, the other side it was the translation in English. So again, I don't know how to read it. I can just look at it. That's it. But fortunately at the last page, there was a, 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 I mean, a prayer, the Mornar Kaddish. Kaddish. Yes. Uh, yeah, Kaddish line, I think. Uh, the mourners Kaddish, yeah, they, some is called Kaddish de Rabana, there's a, but it's a Kaddish, yes. Yeah, it's a Kaddish. So it was starting with Yigadal or Yigadal, I, I forgot. So that that's the word actually, uh, like I saw. So there is the prayer here and the transliteration, not the translation, but the transliteration. So I know, so this first word is this Yigadal. Then I started with single, single word. So it is Ya, the Ga, Allah. Okay, then I started slowly understanding. Yeah, it is read like this. It is read like this. So I found few words like uh, which are very common. Amir, like Amen, and all those things. Then I just caught it and brought brought it down. And it's just like I was learning. It was a Rosetta Stone for me to understand the Hebrew. So I didn't have a former teacher or like former book, like formal book to learn Hebrew. Like Aleph, Bet, Gimel, Dalet, Hey, Wab. No, it was like a different way, a different approach towards the language. Then from there, I went to a, a internet shop nearby and I didn't know how to browse in the internet. So I told, can I get, uh, my friend told me, you can get the alphabets from uh, internet shop. So I told that guy, like, can you just give me some printout of an alphabet, uh, this thing, plus uh, some printing printouts. And so he told, okay, fine. He took me, it took 20 rupees and he gave me two printouts. Thank you. Then. The day from that day I started understanding. Yeah, it's yod, it's dalet, it's wow, it's gimel, it's meme, wow. meme sofit, no noon sofit. So I started learning. So the, from there I started understanding. Like then I can like slowly read Hebrew, like Bereshit Bara Elohim So I can read like slowly, and then I understood. So it was a span of two weeks. I learned Hebrew myself. Then wow. from there, I was just wow. reading, writing, reading, writing. All the, all the. I I used to have uh, sleepless nights those times. So 
apparently i used to learn arabic because i was a very very weak or least interested student in my arabic classes so when uh, <laughs> when this hebrew came along with me so if i didn't know arabic i will never be able to read hebrew mm. so that was my helping tool so through arabic i learned hebrew and they both went through very easily and that's how i learned <laughs> the language and the tragedy happened like in my life that i failed in my second i mean 12th grade i thought that is the end of my life oh, oh my God. like it's i cannot face the failure so that was very hard i never used to go outside but years after i realized that was the golden time god gave me one year to sit in my house and learn the language the scripture the uh, the history uh, and whatever i hold right now in my hand as a skill or a learn learning learn stuff it's only because i failed in my 12th grade i proudly say to my friends my colleagues my juniors my relatives small aspiring students you have to fail in your life once to enjoy the the blessing that you have when you uh, like win <laughs> wow wow so if you don't know what is bitterness you will never understand the real sweetness of a sweet so that's what i learned from my life and i gave my 100 percentage to learn language and history and all was on the basis of the curiosity but initially maybe i'll say it was like a, a religion uh, compa- religious comparison study during my that time i was very much into like uh, into telling okay your scripture is like that my scripture is like this and we used to have discussions and uh, some kind of conversations over it but later on that just give you a particular uh, i'll say like for a while you will feel happy that you have one over a person or his belief on with your but going like like learning about the religion and everything we realize that that doesn't have much thing to give uh, or like in your life there is nothing that you are winning over a person's belief through uh, i mean debate or conversation no it's just to love each other understand each other and live in peace that's the that's the ultimate thing we all wanted in the life that's what i learned in course of this around 17 years or 18 years my life that's the journey what i had with this language and religion so it was not only judaism it was all other religion uh, about which i learned like christianity let it be buddhism so uh, and so other so many religions i learned about those and it's just help us to understand how a human being has to be how mm. uh, we have to have the compassion we have to have and that's what even my religion taught me and that's what even all the other religion teaches so ultimate aim is peace peace and peace <laughs> amen amen i mean that's um, that's really beautiful how uh when you started talking about the the the, cur- the 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 journey that you took that was rooted in curiosity and in uh just a an interest in in learning for your own sake right and and there's something very inspiring about that that you taught yourself hebrew um and uh and so it's at, at the same time or maybe it's later uh, please tell me when um when do you start um getting more involved with the um the the jewish community and with some of the individuals that are there so this the learning of this language was like a <clears throat> the abracadabra uh, spell word or like these in indian movies we say kulja simsim <laughs> like the yeah 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 uh, you know open sesame. Yeah, yeah 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 open okay. sesame so yeah it just word spell for me that kul ja sim sim the let the uh, the gates open so the when people realize that i know hebrew language and other things they welcome me very well let it be in the jewish community so when i said i know hebrew i write hebrew i can read hebrew me being a muslim 
So it's a fact of curiosity for them and they embrace me as a friend of the community. So you told me like a leader, but I will not say a leader. I'm a humble person <laughs> by myself. And there are lots of people who get inspired through my work. And uh, there are like lots of youngsters who contact me about, they want to know about the religion, they want to know about the, uh, the history and so and so. So I will help them as much as possible from my ability and the time, uh, how much I have it. So uh, it was through different people I went into that uh, community. So I told you that I used to go to the uh, synagogue every uh, weekdays or weekends during our vacation time. So with my friends, few of my friends. So first time I went to the synagogue and out of blue, I know Hebrew that by that time, but I never approached anybody that I know Hebrew. And I was a little shy at that time. So one day I was sitting inside the synagogue with my friend. Suddenly this, the, it was almost the time of sh uh, shutting down for the queue. So somebody closed the synagogue from outside, inside and they're like a kind of dignitaries were coming inside the synagogue. Like there was a lady. I learned that she was the wife of the, uh, the election commission commissioner that time. So she came to me and she had a security, high security. So, but we were, since we were inside the synagogue, we were not told to go out. But we were sitting, we were kids, like not kids, but still. so this lady came in and uh, there was few other people also with that lady who was sitting. So till that time, I never saw the Torah with my eyes. So that was the day when I am about to see it. So uh, I have only read about the Torah in Quran and read like my uh, teacher used to telling about the, the stories of Musa and uh, hearing uh, what is Torah but I have never seen it in real. So this lady came and uh, the Johnny Halegua is no more. Uh, so he came, he was the one of the eldest member in community. He came to the synagogue and he opened the, uh, the ark and he took out, opened one Torah and he just little bit, he just found the scroll so we can see the, uh, the scriptures in just in one uh, line. So there was a lot, like around 20 or 30 people standing in front of it and they was looking at it. So suddenly one person shouted from the, uh, from the crowd and say, is that kept upside down? So I told, no, <laughs> out of no, I just say, no. So Johnny Halego looked at me, how do you know it? <laughs> so because look, the Hebrew, Hebrew always looks like it is kept upside down. So, so many people have doubts if they don't know Hebrew, they will think it is kept upside down. Yeah. Lots of many friends and uh, uh, acquaintance have told me that it is written upside down. No, no, that's right. <laughs> so I told no. So this guy asked uh, some question. So the attention towards all the people, the 30 people outside uh, standing down have turned to me. And I was a little <laughs> shy. I, like, I was trapped. <laughs> so Johnny uncle, just he asked me like, how do you know that it is? I told, I know a little bit Hebrew, I can just read. And I was just 13 or 14 years old that time. So he told, really, you can read? Yes, I can read, but I don't know, like with, without Nikut, I cannot read it. I can just, may, familiar words I can read, but I don't know how to spell it properly. It might yeah. be a mistake. So I don't, I'm not taking a chance to, but I can tell this is Asher, this is uh, like Amir, what it is, uh, those words. <laughs> Then I saw, luckily, a word Israel. The word, it's written in Israel. Oh, right, you know how to read it. Wow. Then he told me, stay here. And they, the dignitaries went. He asked me, are you a Jew? I told him, no, I'm a Muslim. Oh. How you know this? No, you might be a Jew. I told him, no. <laughs> By no way, I am a Jew. I'm a practicing Muslim. Then how you learn? I told I learned myself. How can you learn my, yourself? It's a very difficult thing. I told him, no, I knew Arabic. And I took my, put my effort in it. And uh, that's how I learned. But still he was not believing me, but ultimately he had to. And that's, that was the end. Then I, I uh, started uh, a good friendship with the, the gatekeeper, the new gatekeeper. So I think the gatekeeper who I spoke to when I was 10 years old was his father or his uncle, I think. <laughs> so to him, he told, you have to meet uh, Samuel Halego, who's the one of the synagogue. He will be helping you to learn more about uh, so. So I told him, okay, fine, uh, I will wait for him. So every day when I used to go, my friends used to accompany me. But now I'm on a mission to meet Samuel Halegua. So I used to go alone sometime. 
by chance if i see i see that's it i cannot go and approach him so one day he came along with a, a young uh, lady who was i think a student from us or uk so he was telling she was asking few many questions and uh, he was very much tired answering the same uh, 100 year old question what he used to hear every day <laughs> so he told like this 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 thing and literally then he started ignoring that lady because it was a very basic question like if a person is coming to do a research about the juice of cochin she or he must have a little basic knowledge he that lady had no other idea so he got tired and he was sitting little, little uneasy so i went and spoke to him and i asked few question which was very relevant that's the reason why he told okay i'll turn to him and he started giving me the answer and he invited me come we'll go to the house and from there i used to go to his house and uh, we used to uh, he, he gave me tea and we used to have a chat and he told me his side uh, because there was some the first mosque of india is in kerala i told you yes. so that was uh, reconstructed or uh, like expanded with a very unscientific way so he was very sad because of that he told you have to preserve the history he went the Jew, samuel halego went and met the imam and the council to request them don't do like do a big expansion destroying the real structure but you have to do uh, a proper study about it i can put you put people in touch with you who are experts in it but they somehow had done a different job so he was very sad and he shared his view and just to add on it now the in uh, the kerala government and the two all, all have a uh, building that old uh, uh, mosque into its previous glory and previous style so they are just demolish oh. all the new structure and they are putting it back so maybe oh. samuel halegwa sami angles uh, wish is coming true in wow. in near future so that is one thing so then we started slowly he i asked some doubts about the judaism and the cochini jewish history so he used to give me a very good answer like very specific and he used to talk about the internal jewish history which i was not much aware or at that point of time i was not much interested also like he was to talk about the bar kokba revolt and uh, the, the hanukkah uh, the story behind the hanukkah festival and all those things so i didn't know much about so i was very curious about the jewish culture and uh, the history in cochin but he also started talking so and related that with the cochini style mm-hmm. and uh, about the food about thing so it went few then i started uh, like i uh, i was about to join a school a culinary school so i when i met sami uncle for the last time i gifted him a hebrew calligraphy of 10 commandments uh-huh. and a oil painting of menorah so that uh-huh. was my gift to him he so happily he accepted it and uh, yeah. so i came back and i went to school so that was around in 2007 i think this so we, we used to meet like lots of time so 2007 i went and joined my school so after that 2009 uh, t- till 2009 i was not having much contact with because i was far away like almost 300 kilometers away from my home city but still i was in touch with uh, the my studies and hebrew and everything i used to do some calligraphy works and send it to ukraine us uk and i used to have my pocket money from that <laughs> <laughs> during my college days then uh, in 2009 uh, i have written i took like i got a mail like by that time i started slowly doing my preservation and learning thing and putting something in the blog in the form of blog and all those things so people started approaching me for more <clears throat> knowledge and they used to ask me questions so when they ask one question i will go behind that to understand what is that question i get 100 answers so this 100 answers enable me to answer another 100 questions which will be coming in my uh, like way in future so that's how this knowledge of the the informations came to me i started approaching people who are into the jewish history the, the people from the community learning much about them so it was all going on so in 2009 was the time when i met sara and t in person and that was also a similar thing so i was going to meet one of my friend uh, so he told he was working with me so like i do have a industrial training for 6 months so uh one one of my friend who was training with me he told i want to meet i want to go to synagogue and the palace and so 
you take me there. I told, okay, come on this day, we'll meet from this place and we'll. So he told me, you take your calligraphy things also, I want to see it. So I took all the calligraphy things like Hebrew. I used to write Birchat Habay and I had 10 different style of Birchat Habay, which I have written. So I had that in my, like in a bag and I took. It. So this guy, uh, we met, we went to synagogue, we went to other mm-hmm. and we had uh, uh, all this food and chat. So way back, we were standing in front of Sarah and his house. So, and she was standing near to the door and she was looking and just looking at the people and she was a very uh, happy soul. So my friend insisted me go and show her, this is your work. No, no, I told no, no, I feel so shy for it. No, he insisted me like hell and he took me there, showed, he showed. She was surprised to go and she asked me at least hundred times that, are you Jew? Are you Jew? No, I don't know. I'm a Muslim. I'm a Muslim. I'm a Muslim. I have to say it hundred times. She never believed she was seeing that I was a Jew, but kind of. And she was so happy to see. She told, you have to meet Taha, who is like the person who take care of me. He also writes some Hebrew. He don't know to write, but he uh, always helped the other people to get the things done when there is a requirement in the synagogue or with Sarah and Tell, and he executes it. So now you know Hebrew, so it's very good thing that I will be having somebody to help us. So that uh, that was the time when we started our uh, relation. So she took me, she gave me her favorite snacks, like we, the Rossel cookies, it's known as Achapam. And uh, there is other snacks with tea. So we started sitting, chatting, and she was so lively and happy seeing a person uh, who can write and read Hebrew. So I was waiting for Taha who came like around three or four hours after. So my friend have left already to his room and I had a, a off day. So I thought of, I'll spend my day here and uh, meet all the people. So from that day, every, every weekdays or my off days, I used to go to Sarandi's house. Wow. Sometimes I carry her favorite snacks because <laughs> that's food, art, are the two things which will connect you to uh, put in touch with the people. <laughs> okay. And both in, both are in my hand. Sometimes I used to prepare food and take it to Sarandi. Sometimes I buy it and take it to Sarandi. So mm. she loved those things, the chat and the food. And uh, she used to have a very English style tea from her house. And I used to take all the, the Kerala style snacks. So this was the two things which was <laughs> accompanied uh, between our chat and so the neighbors also joined. There was uh, Gamaliel Salem, there was Rima Salem, there was Isaac Ashkenazi. These people will join and they will sit along and they used to give, like, I was, I have to just sit and hear the stories, what they have, the conversation, their, the slang, the words they use, which are not, not used by the other people in coaching. So I learned many things from those chats. So I had, so I will put on one question in. So how was the marriage during the, those times? So one person will start. So then the other person, no, 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 it was like this. Hey, you ha- do you remember this thing? So this kind of questions and so information was like a, like flowing in during wow. this conversation. So it was so interesting for me. My they were uh, like three or four times el- uh, like Your age. elder than of my age. Yeah, I was 40, <laughs> less than eighteen or seventeen or eighteen years old that time. So uh, that time, uh, these people were around 60 plus. So they were three times my age. Wow. So I, I'm sitting and recording everything <laughs> like in my memory and I was feeding everything in memory. Plus the, the servants of that community, they also joined. By six o'clock, they will come to watch the drama in the TV, <laughs> TV serials. So uh, the series in the TV. And I will ask questions to them also. So how do you prepare the food? Oh, that's very difficult during Pesa. It's very difficult. We have to clean the entire house, this, that. You have to use new vessels. So I used to get them lots of information from them. So the guarded recipes were in the hand of the, the Jews. So in, in 2009 to 2011, I had done my culinary, I mean, my academic research on the Jewish cuisine of Cochin and the tradition from wow. there. So I have wow. collected the recipe from all. I have uh, like compiled and it was uh, compiled as a research. It was my academic research during wow. my college. Wow. And, and so that, 
those relationships that you um, that you built not only not only was it enriching for you, but from you know I, I did some of my own research and and uh, um, and throughout the years I've been also following what you're doing, but it seems like it was also um, you used it as an opportunity to share this with the yes. world because especially yes. now i'm understanding it this is an elderly community they might not be so tech savvy they might you know they're preserved they're I'll, show, I'll show you one thing how sarah and t you know how close she was so on her uh, anniversary uh, so this was the lamp which i lighted in the cochini style so they used to put water and the oil and i have lighted this candle on her memory it was a tribute from my side like I cannot do the prayer or something, but this was something. And uh, you remember the word what she told, there is somebody to help my community. That was a word when she told me. Wow. So on that note, if I look into the future, when this uh, Johnny Hunger who died, uh, who was the person who showed me the Torah first time, he, when he died, after that Gami uh, Salem and the Rima Salem, and at the end, when uh, Sarah and he died or Isa Kashkanazi died. So when these people like left us, it is the uh, responsibility of the family to take uh, care of their rituals and they are doing, they have done it well. So I also felt that I was, we were a part of family and I also had to contribute something. And that contribution meant in the form of helping them in getting their, the tombstone inscriptions done. So Johnny Angus, wife called me and told like I need a help from your side and I helped and uh, that was the first time I'm helping to kind of proofread and the Hebrew inscription to be engraved into the marble so I what? went me and Taha went to the the engraver and told you have to write this letter like this don't elongate the space or don't make it smaller don't make it bigger it has to be the way it is written there no changes from your side so I was supervising the person wow. and do, getting it done. And for the Sarah and uh, tombstone, uh, like I took the permission from their uh, existing family. And I told I, I want that honor of doing it from my side. So I want to design it from my, through my hand and get it done. And it was done. Few days back, uh, like I sent the, like the design to Taha and got approved from her uh, relatives and Inshallah, it will be in the tombstone as, as an eternal, I mean, connection between me and Sarah and T, like, as wow. a, in the form of tombstone. Inshallah. So that's the like humanity level. So if you look at, or somebody look at me and say, it's against your religion or it's not, you guys are enemy. I will not take it into like account because what I learned from my religion was different. The Prophet Muhammad, uh, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, peace be upon him, he, uh, was a person who's an example, uh, like, like setting an example. So he, when he saw, uh, uh, you might be have heard this story, like he was sitting with his companions and one uh, procession was, a funeral procession was going on and it was of a Jew. So he stood up and he uh, expressed his uh, respect to that, I mean, the dead person. So his companion asked, why you have stood up and uh, because he's a Jew. So he told, he might be a Jew, but he's a person, he's a dead person. We have to extend our respect to it. So that's what I learned from my religion. Wow. That's what I also want to like put in my life, in my life and show to the other people. It's the religion is all about peace and respecting each other. And also when I, uh, it's in Quran, it is written in Quran also. Like if there is a threat to a synagogue, or, or like, I'm not quoting the entire word. I'm just giving the literal meaning. And this is what I heard from a masjid uh, during my Friday prayer. That if there is the the imam was telling talking like this. If there is a threat to a church or a synagogue, a house of uh, the the one God, who all the Semitic religion believe is having a threat, it is your responsibility. It is the Muslim's responsibility to take care of it, and. You are the people responsible to keep it safe. So that's what I learned from my religion. But so that's what I'm implementing in my religion. So it's all about peace, coexistence, understanding each other. And this last word, the understanding each other is a very, very, very important thing. If you don't understand each other, you will never be able to live in peace 
and there will be no coy sixth. So you understand so, wow. and get along well. That is the final thing for the piece. And I'm talking from my own mm. uh, and, uh, experience because if you don't have the right understanding about a particular people, you will not be able to, you are nobody to judge them. Mm, mm. So you will be having said, lots of misconceptions. Yeah, mm. you be having lots of misconceptions about the other, the counterpart. Like, let it be with a Muslim. The, maybe a person from another religion look at Muslim as a particular people, and he will be having something in his mind. Yeah, they are like this, like this. They do like this. They are this kind of people. So, the, like, looking at the same, like, looking at the Jews, we will be having a wrong perception about them. They are like this. They do like this. But it might not be the truth. Unless and until you go and understand, you learn about them, you will not be the right person to talk about them. You will not be the right person to judge them. So that's what. So that's why I'm learning about even my religion, their religion, all the religions and their basic belief. Yeah. That's beautiful. So well said, Tofik. I, uh, I, I have a final thing to to ask you. I mean, we can talk. Uh, <laughs> Forever, yeah, we can go long and long talking about this. Yeah, and I have so many more <laughs> uh, questions, maybe for, for another time. But what I just wanted to um, finish with asking you about I, you, you've spoken uh, a good amount about your, your your journey, your artistic journey, and your journey of um, of becoming familiar with Hebrew, um, and then and then the calligraphy that you were doing. And I was wondering if you could just talk a little bit more about your interest in, in calligraphy and how both in Arabic and in Hebrew and how it's uh, allowed you to connect with people around the world. Mm -hmm. so you mentioned a little bit about this, but if you could touch more upon uh, your, your craft and the way in which it has allowed you to build these connections and what the reactions um, have been from, uh, from, from different people. So I'll tell you, like. I do, like I'm quoting my own word that I do, food and art, are the two things which will connect uh, two people or not even two people to community or two country. So that's what I believe. So food is one thing which I prepare every day in my life and that is profession. I'm a chef profession. So art is something I do like every time, even the food, the plating, the pressure of food on the plate is an art. Like you take a plate and you think it is canvas and you put food in it in a very artistic way. That's how we do the food thing. So, uh, same goes. You have a canvas. You can see me like all this are my every calligraphy was. It's in the wall here behind. Okay. So I do all those things and I share uh, my views in the, like I try to put my views in the canvas, if you understand. Yes, yes, yes. Like uh, if I do a, imagine that a Buddhist mandala, I can show you a picture, like I will show you a canvas uh, right now if you want. It's an Arabic calligraphy, which have some Arab, uh, the, the Buddhist mandala concept plus uh, Islamic geometrical pattern. I'll just show you, just give me a few seconds. Yes, yes. It's a little huge. I don't know. Wow. Stunning. So it's a fusion. It's a fusion of different beautiful of yes, different you can cultures see the, uh, and the Quranic words here. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So you can see the, the the geometrical patterns of the Islamic geometrical pattern, plus wow. the mandala concept here, the lotus and all this the the clouds and other some Buddhist Tibetan style of painting. Beautiful. Here again at the bottom, you can see all this. So it's like a concept which I need to share. Wow. So I'll show you one more thing. So this is a small scribbling. So you can see mm -hmm. there is some, it's written Ramadan Kari. You can see. I hope you will say what it is. It's beautiful, the Talit, yeah. And it's Ramadan Karim also and even in Hebrew. The, uh, the Arabic. The, the Kufiya, yes. So you can see it's beautiful. It's image, but yeah. 
So this is something. It's a, like a moon, shape of a moon. Correct. So you can see this is something which I uh, try to put in my artworks, but I don't have my artworks right now where I am. So that's why I'm just showing few pieces here. Yeah. So, so with your art, you're making your own statement. That is one thing. Less, I use my. Uh, uh, so uh, one of my other interest is like learning the scriptures, like the Hebrew language, and translating the old tombstones, which is like a key to the history. So you can see, like, I'm. These are my notebooks. Like, so I wow. write. Hebrew inscription in the stone here. I'll do translation in the local language. It's it's wow. done on the request of the people who are who want to learn about the thing. So you can see the scripture, the transformation and mistakes, which I was trying to show. Wow. Uh, and you can see here. Yes. Some of wow. My writing, but I think it's seen in the mirror image. No, no, I'm seeing it exactly. It's beautiful. So these are my notebooks. That's what I'm show, showing. So you're continuing for you, even though you are right now working very hard in really in Dubai. Second, you, one of my favorite Arabic piece. Oh my gosh! It's, it's, an, it's a Quranic verse, no? Why uh, Amri? Mm-hmm. Oh, so these so, are my uh, few uh, artworks, which I can show you right now. <laughs> Amazing. And thank you also. I know you shared with me um, some more images. Uh, there was a, a slideshow that you sent me. Yeah. Rafiq, it's, you know, your whole story is, it's, it's so touching and so inspiring because at the core of it is a person who has curiosity and who wants to, as you said, um, understand and, and who has taken the time and the energy um, to to understand and to pursue that, but on your own, not in a formal way, right? Sometimes people think, well, if I don't get training in as a historian, I can't do this, or if I don't get training as a artist, I can't do it. And you are you prove all of that wrong because you're what had uh, what has allowed you to connect with the Cochini community, to create um, uh, Cochini Jewish community, to create this uh, uh, beautiful Hebrew and multilingual calligraphy, to gain knowledge of Jewish scriptures. All of that came from a, a very pure place of, of, of curiosity. And, and that is inspiring. That message I know will be and has been inspiring for people who want to pursue things who want to to just become yes. better at something or to or to like it was a knowledge. small curiosity which came out of me and it grew on with me <laughs> exactly <laughs> so well, that curiosity of that 10 year old guy who met up uh, is still with me so wow. when and, and where required i have to be that 10 year old guy and that curiosity is still with me and i'm uh, try, still learning understanding and learning never ends understanding never ends and that's what yes. it's all about. Tawfiq, I want to thank you so much again, brother, for being on this call with me and for all that you have done and that you continue to do and for uh, your curiosity, your energy, your, um, your love for humanity. May that curiosity never, uh, never go away and may it continue inspiring people. I know it inspires me as someone who is involved in interfaith community work and as an artist. So thank you. And I'm sure it's ins inspiring so many others. So bless you for all that you do. And thank you for, uh, thank for you your time. Much. Okay. Thank you very much. God bless you too.